measurement is really, it really dictates how well you can do continuous improvement. If you're not measuring something very well, it's very difficult to continually improve. Today, I'm excited to welcome John Knotts back to the show. Now, um, John is um, a Gimba Academy employee here. He's been one of our senior coaches, and he, in fact, he's doing uh, the majority of the heavy lifting now for our, our Green Belt and our Black Belt uh, certification program. And uh, he's uh, he's fantastic. And uh, this is the third time I think he's been on the show. And today, we, we kind of dig into, we got a little bit geeky and talked a little bit about um, about collecting data and how to make sense of data. And so often when we're, we're coaching candidates here in our, on our Lean and Six Sigma certification programs, in the beginning, we're trying to say, well, what problem are you trying to solve and how do you know it's a problem? And honestly, it's sometimes it's the hardest part of the whole journey is getting folks and getting some data collected, getting organized, getting into the correct type of graph or chart or whatever it is that we're going to use. So that's kind of where we spend the majority of the uh, of the conversation is on that topic. We get into also some things like some of the top two or three tools that John feels that everybody should be using. I mean, obviously, respect for people is always at the top. But in the end, there's some there's some, some specific tools that we really all need to be able to wield according so we get into that. And then right at the end, uh, so John is this prolific LinkedIn poster. He posts every day on LinkedIn. And I don't mean just like a little lame story. He's got like some deep thought, basically a blog article um, on the daily on his LinkedIn uh, channel there for his personal profile. And so the other day he wrote one um, talking about being the rock. And it was one of my favorite um, posts that he's, that he's made. And so I asked him to explain that one. So that's right towards the end where, where John talks about how to be the rock <laughs> in maybe a, a storm or whatever it might be. So some pretty good stuff. So show notes can be found over at GembaPodcast.com. Just look for episode 439. Again, GembaPodcast.com. Look for episode 439. Okay, enough for me. Let's get to the show. John, welcome to the show. How's it going? Getting all the bugs worked out. Yeah, welcome back to the show. Yeah, we had a few little technical difficulties with our new platform here. I think it was more hardware error on my end, but <laughs> we got it worked out. So thanks for your patience, John. All right. Well, hey, um, yeah, so this is the third time that you've been on to the shows. So we've had some fun in the past talking about horse farms and and then more traditional getting uh, Lean and Six Sigma stuff. But uh, today I'm excited to uh, kind of continue the story. Um, but in case folks um, don't know who you are, John, before you do your quote, give us a little background on, on who you are and what you do for Gamba Academy. Well, I, I'm obviously John Knotts, and I have been in process improvement and improving organizations for close to 33 years since 1990. Got involved in the Air Force's Total Quality Management Program and worked in a lot of different organizations, worked as a external consultant with Booz Allen, internal with USAA, Fortune 100 company, and right now working with the Gemba, helping out with the Lean Six Sigma training and certification program, doing a lot of coaching for individuals that are going through that program. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. All right. Well, um, you, you know, at the beginning of every show, we like to get uh, our guests to share a quote. So what do you got today, John? Well, I, I thought it would be appropriate because we're going to be kind of talking about continuous improvement, but this is a Mark Twain quote that I kind of keep in my back pocket, that continuous improvement is better than delayed perfection. Mm. Yeah. And in a way, it's like a dichotomy, like delayed perfection, like assuming that you can even get to perfection, right? <laughs> so, Well, so. I think it's, imp you know, we're going to talk about measurement. Mm -hmm. And measurement is really, it really dictates how well you can do continuous improvement. If you're not measuring something very well, and we'll talk about that, but if you're not measuring something very well, it's very difficult to continually improve. You'll do huge improvements because you really don't have a good measurement system in place. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to get as much done. This is one of the problems I see over and over again with organizations that they don't understand the problem well enough 
and they end up taking forever to try to get everything done. As you've said in videos, <laughs> boil the ocean. Yeah. yeah, no, it's so true. I mean, you know, and all the folks that we're all we're all coaching here, whether they're green belts, black belts, master black belts. I mean, I always say that the hardest part of, of more of a traditional, say, like the make style project, it's it's D, <laughs> you know, like defining the problem and like, yeah. what problem are you trying to solve? How do you know it's a problem? You know, and I always tell people fixing it gets the easy part. You know, once we get into analyze and improve, it's like, well, that's the fun part. And I don't know, it's necessarily easy, but it's a. Uh, Boy, if you get the D wrong, you're doomed, right? If you if you don't define the problem right. correctly, you're doomed. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, well, so with that, I guess foundation there. Let's let's dig in a little bit on on data collection, um, because we're many organizations, even when they say, "Oh, we don't measure things," they actually do. I mean, a lot of companies are probably more data rich than they realize they are. Um, it's just that they don't, they might not collect it correctly or they might not organize it correctly. So if we started there with like maybe even this like frequency of data collection and, 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 and the style of data collection, like what do you recommend when, when people are kind of getting going with this? When we go through project selection, in the defined phase of a process, and we're talking about how to find a project, the biggest advice I give is find something you're currently measuring. But when it comes to data, because if you're currently measuring it, you've just eliminated a long piece of your project because you have to collect enough data to be able to make a decision. We don't make a decision off of the last piece mm -hmm. of data. And so here's the, the advice that I give to people is that if you're measuring and reporting something on a monthly basis, mm -hmm. now let's say uh, how many, when you, when you talk to coaching clients, how many data points do you think somebody needs to have a good trend? <laughs> I mean, I mean, <laughs> a lot. I mean, honestly, I mean, well, you know, minimum, I, what would you need? I usually say six. Yeah, well, I mean. Two is a trend. Yeah. Officially. I mean, I, I think officially even on our you, videos where, we, you know, we're, we're, we're more snobbish even than that in, you know, trying to get, you know, 15, 20, 30 data points. But it's just sometimes it's not even realistic, if, especially if they're at the beginning of the thing. And they're like, we don't track it. Okay, we'll start tracking it right now. <laughs> you know, right. and can we get exactly. daily or Now weekly? think about that. Let's, yeah. Let's see if we what happens if you're do, if you're collecting something on a monthly basis. Yeah. If you needed thirty data yeah. points, and it's a it's a long. <laughs> All right, you can work on this in yeah, two years. It's a years. long defined phase. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but that's the whole yeah. thing. Even at six, even at six data points, to be able to tell, you know, like first off, what's going on, and then did I make a difference at the end? Six data points. Okay, get me at least that much. That's six months if you're looking at right. something monthly. And most businesses look at things yep. monthly. Yep. They, you know, they report out their revenue. They look at their profit margin. They, you know, it's like always a monthly, and that's way yep. too late. So getting something that's monthly into a weekly basis, you just turn six months yep. into two yep. months. Really, six weeks. But I, I tend to say get two cycles. Yep. So if it's monthly, then get two months. That way you see month yep. over month. And if you get something daily, you need six days. Typically, that would be two weeks. That's amazing. You can shrink your time to make a decision yep. from six months to two weeks. And if you're doing something that's like hourly, in yeah. a day, you would know if you've yeah. made a difference. And, you know, like you could go a week and be like, okay, that's good. But if you're doing continuous improvement, and this is, I think, the thing about that quote that's so important. If you want to do continuous improvement, you want to break your problem down to a tiny pieces using all of the tools, Pareto and ANOVA and SPC and all this analysis tree diagramming things and understanding where specifically is this problem occurring? What can I do yeah. about it? And then 
putting one solution in place. And if you are collecting data daily, in two weeks, you'll know, okay, I made a difference. Yep. Or I didn't, and I need to go back to the drawing board. And that's where, that's why I think what happens with this delayed perfection is that we don't collect stuff yeah. fast enough to be able to make any significant improvements. So instead of doing very small improvements, we try to do right. everything and the right. kitchen sink. Well, and I only think like when, when we're dealing with monthly data, you know, some people people will say, we, we only have it available monthly. I can only get it monthly. So, well, you know what? It's being tracked somewhere every minute, exactly. <laughs> you know, every day. It's somewhere. It's in <laughs> nope. a system. So we might need to get our IT architecture friends involved and, you know, pulling it out of ERP systems or whatever it might be. But, you know, by definition, if you can get it monthly, you can get it weekly. Um, and the, the other reason that yep. I love daily and weekly data hourly even better right but like once you make and counter implement countermeasures forget to find phase say we're in a, we're in analyze and improve you know and we want to test out some implement some countermeasures and see how it works against those root causes that our team thinks might be driving the problem well you get monthly data you're waiting three four months just to see if you made it better right and that's only three or four data points right you know to your point if you want six then right. you know wait another couple months so whereas if you have weekly or daily data, it's much faster. Not to mention the problem with monthly data is that, you know, the way things were going six, seven months ago might not even be relevant anymore. <laughs> you know, we might have exactly. A- well, in reality, if you're doing something monthly, see, I always believe that you should get a cycle and a cycle in a monthly type environment is really a, it's yeah. a 13 month yep. rolling because you want to see January yep. versus January. You want right. to be able to compare month to month, right. year to year. And it's, unfortunately, sometimes we work on things. And this is where not in a process improvement certification. We don't want to do this here. But you still have to improve things like the right. budget process, the end of right. year, the end of quarter, which only happens right. occasionally. So, you know, like you're not going to wait around and say, did I make a difference six years from now on something? So there are there are exceptions, obviously, to this. But when you can get to the data faster and and every process like end of year, there's an end of quarter, there's an end of month and there's a bunch of process steps that are very similar. And if you can streamline those similar process steps. And just not worry about the stuff that only happens once a yep. quarter, once a year, then you can really affect things faster. And that's what it's all about. It's getting yeah, to things for sure. faster. Okay, so we spent some time on frequency. What about like the type of data? What are you what are you looking for there, John? Is there any type of data um, or or measure that you're that you're wanting to see or you're you're advising folks to uh, to, to examine? There's Three things that I think are imperative to improving a process. Now, there's a lot of data to run an organization. But when it talks about improving a process, you should be looking at the volume that's coming into the process or the volume that's going through the process. How much work are we doing? That tells you what your workload looks like. And you can look at that you know, day over day and really tell, like, how busy are my people? How busy are we? And when when the spikes happen, what do we do about it? In a certain extent, a lot of organizations, when they're working on a process, that process is within a Mm -hmm. bunch of processes. And so they're not in control of what drives Mm -hmm. the volume. So it really is a reactive, it's a lagging Mm -hmm. indicator. But when you know the cycle time of your process along with your volume, Now you truly understand what it takes to do that per accomplishment. And you can start working on that. And the last thing is defects. So if you're looking at your volume, your cycle time, and your defects, you have the ability to continually improve things, remove those defects, and make that process faster so that you can do more of it. And you should be able to see that if you're looking at that data. Right. I know you're a fan just because I know, you know, I work with you of, of, of trended data. A lot of times we'll see organizations with the, what do you call it? Like kind of like the, the stoplight style, um, stop, you know, chart. Um, 
and it's very common, right? You'll see it on a lot of dashboards and project plans or whatever it might be. In some cases, maybe they're okay, you know, kind of to giving a status of, of how things might be working, but, but really shouldn't be trying to manage our business with it. <laughs> At least I don't believe so. So like, <laughs> w- what's your thoughts on like trended data and the importance of that? Well, it, what happens when you look at something in a month over month view, and especially when it's just a color on a chart, people react yeah. to red. Oh yeah. my God, what's going on? And we know that pr- processes go up and down. You know, it's just, the, you know, it's common for things to be at a high or be at a low. And it could be during yeah. the type of year, you know, this could be just a cyclical right. type behavior or even the time of month, it could be a cyclical thing right. that just happens. But what happens is when people only look at the last data point, and typically that's in a color, then they react to that. And oh my God, we got to solve this. I, I can't tell you the number of times that, oh, we, we got a lot of defa or we got a lot of customer complaints that went to the CEO. So we got to do something about this problem. And when you look at the overall process, you go, this is not a different, any different than the number yeah. of customer complaints you get yeah. on a regular basis. It's just that they went to the CEO. So suddenly it was like, yeah. it hit a red. Yep. So it, when people manage that way, it, is so hard to try to improve things because you're just chasing what commonly occurs. Yeah, it's very in a emotional process. as well, right? Lots of emotions. It could be we're either Extremely. happy and we're so awesome because we're green, or you know, fire everybody. <laughs> we're red. We need a new team. You know, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Whereas, yeah, it's the whole concept yeah, of common absolutely. cause variation versus special cause variation. You know, if we don't, we can't see a signal from the noise, then you know. We're, we're, we're really doomed. I'm wondering, um, something that also was, it's interesting when I, when I'm working with my, my candidates is, you know, obviously, and I know, I know you do the same thing. And so does Steve, you, one of the things we do early on when we're looking at a, a data set is trying to determine what type of data are we dealing with? Is it parametric or non-parametric or normally distributed versus not normally distributed? And if it's, if it's not normal, um, you know, we, we typically go with the median and the range. And if it's normal, we'll go with the mean and standard deviation to describe that data. Have you seen folks kind of get in trouble with that? If maybe they have a, what we would call a not normally distributed data, maybe it's lead time or some data like that, that's going to be naturally skewed. And they all of a sudden want to start talking about the mean and the standard deviation. You're like, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, have you seen that a lot in your, your experience? And not only not only do you see it, but unfortunately, sometimes the statistical mm. programs lie because mm. they're fooled by the data. And if you don't look at the if you don't look at the charts that the data is looking at, and that's the thing I always say, you know, when we when we're walking through analysis and we're we start with talking about charts and graphs. What we're doing is that we're doing inferential Mm -hmm. statistics on our own. We're looking at the data in a chart and we're making decisions or we're making assumptions off of what we see. But you've, you know, you've noticed that like in every test that's run, everything that we do, it spits out a chart. The computer is looking at those charts, but it's looking at the data behind the charts and it's saying, this is what I see. But sometimes, like I've seen processes where there's three separate processes. So you have a histogram that, you know, goes up and down and up and down three times. So it's got three peaks in it. But it looks like, according to the data, because there's overlap of the numbers, it looks like Mm -hmm. a very normal process. And it'll say, oh, this is a normal distribution. Yep. And it's not. It's actually three different yeah. processes in one. <laughs> What's going on? And it's just yeah. not clear where the break is. But until you actually look at that true chart and histogram, yeah. you wouldn't see that. And and there can be sometimes when you have numbers that are really far out and they're throwing off your overall, it can yeah. really mess up things too. So you have to look at things from both perspectives. And that's what I think a lot of people struggle with. 
Yeah. What's your two cents on that? You just mentioned uh, an interesting one that you'll see a lot is you'll have two or three super huge outliers, something crazy happened, you know, a year ago or whatever. What's your, your sense on someone's kind of chartering up their project? Do you want them to drop those off or do you want them to keep them in or what, what, how do you handle that? So when, when, Typically, when people are starting out and they're trying to learn this stuff, they don't really know mm-hmm. a whole lot about charting anything. So they have data, and when you look at it, you'd be like, mm, I yeah. kind of know what's going on here. But to jump ahead and start to start teach you know, certain things, you're like, okay, why don't you go back yeah. to the descriptive statistics and just yeah. run the basics and look at this and see what's actually happening because I'll bet – you got some really high numbers in there that are, yeah. you know, outliers. You know, it's a, a thing, you know, everybody teaches measurement systems analysis, and they teach gauge R&R and attribute agreement analysis. Now, those are tools that, you know, are everywhere. The thing is, is that we pull data out of computer mm. systems nowadays. They'll put iPads or tablets on machines, or the machines are actually collecting mm-hmm. it via infrared scanners or, you know, motion scanners. Or you're pulling information out of like a human resource information system, data with start and stop yeah. times and dates and all this. And it's it's giving you this data. And we download reams and reams of data, which is great because we have all kinds of data to work with. The problem is there is no MSA for this. There's no way to test it statistically. So I always tell people, so I call gauge R&R and attribute agreement analysis a quantitative measurement systems analysis. But when you're pulling data from a system, you need to do a qualitative MSA, which means you need to pull it into some kind of spreadsheet and you need to sort your data columns that you're going to be doing analysis on. And you need to mm. look for anomalies. Anomalies that you wouldn't normally see. You'll run your analysis and those big numbers or those blanks won't show up, but they could be affecting things. So I, you, when, you, when you do your analysis of that and you sort it ascending, descending, you'll start yeah. to see gaps that appear. Like, wow, right. where'd that number come from? I had a guy that was working on a, a process improvement and they were collecting downtime. And they ran into two situations because of the, the tablet that they were collecting it on. There were way too many mm. reasons for downtime. So everybody was just selecting other. They weren't scrolling through all the reasons. They were just selecting other. So he ran a Pareto analysis and he had two other columns, the one that Pareto mm-hmm. automatically creates yeah. <laughs> when there's too many items and yeah. the other column that everybody was selecting. <laughs> and the others, and they were both on both right. ends of the, the spectrum there. And this is, this is stuff that's happening in, it, it's happening in this data that we yeah. get more and more from systems. And we need to make sure that the data that right. we're using is right. valid. So, when you think about, there's a lot of tools available to us as continuous improvement practitioners. Um, and we got videos on pretty much all of them. <laughs> like, but are there, are there any that you <laughs> really think stand out from, from some of the other ones, that, some tools that folks really should be, you know, um, looking into and using as they're trying to improve their process? When it, when it comes to continuous improvement, Continuous improvement means that everybody is improving things as they see problems. It means that they have the basic abilities to detect and to make improvements. They're empowered to make improvements. So when it comes to teaching the worker, you know, like the person who is in charge of this process, maybe there's like eight things that they do. And I always share three things. One is the control chart. Teach them how to enter their data and then put it into a control chart and let them and teach them how to read it. What are you seeing? And when mm-hmm. should you do something about this? Teach them a Pareto chart. So if they have multiple things that are going on or they have multiple defects, put those in a Pareto view. 
And you can build these things in an Excel yep. file that all they have to do is enter the data. And third, and this one's probably the more difficult, mm -hmm. is a box plot. Because a box plot will show you truly the differences between what's going on versus where a Pareto yeah. just kind of puts it into a rank order. And I'll tell you, I, I did this with USAA and we were working, there was eight processes or document processing activities and we taught the team how to identify what was a defect. Mm -hmm. That's always an interesting discussion. Because they don't see right. them, they don't see things as right. defects. They just see them as part of the process. But once they understood it was a defect, then they just counted them. Every time it happened, put a little line on a chart, check sheet, and then at the end of the day, put that data into this Excel spreadsheet for the day. And they did that, and I let them just go, and I taught them how to read the charts and everything, and yeah. I let them just enter it for three months, working on other things. Came back and I looked to open up the data and I looked at it and like half of the problems mm -hmm. that they had had almost disappeared. Immediately I was like, mm, right. I wonder if they're counting the data right. anymore. Maybe they stopped. So I went and I asked like, hey, what happened? Like, oh, well, we just fixed the problem. Okay. <laughs> they recognized yeah. that the problem exists. They could see it. They picked up the phone and they said, hey, we keep getting this this way. Right. Why is that happening? Right. Oh, we didn't know that. <laughs> and it, let's let's fix that problem. And they yeah. fixed the problem, and it pretty much went away. But that's when they see it, and those three charts yeah. show you that. Of course, as a practitioner, I mean, there's so many things that you got to bring to the table. But when it comes to continuous improvement, we yeah. want that done at the at the exactly. front line. Yeah, you mentioned. Um, you know, control chart, Pareto chart, you mentioned check sheet in there, different types of graphs. One of our, our more popular courses that's actually in the, um, in the school of lean, it's not even in our school of six Sigma. Um, it is that seven QC tools course, you know, where we're going through graphs, check sheet, Pareto chart, cause and effect diagram, yeah. scatter diagram, histogram, and control chart. Yeah. Control chart. And yeah, man, you know, it's like, you don't have to the get basics. too crazy here, people, you know, <laughs> just, just get in there and, and, and start studying your data and adding context to the data. That's, that's the power of the control chart, right? Is that we're adding context to it, you know, with those control limits and, and maybe you, you throw in the moving right. range graph at the bottom, if you want to get even fancier, <laughs> you know, um, but boy, it's a powerful tool. Just that, that simple <laughs> tool right there. Well, and usually you're just looking at you're you're looking at things like volume of work you're looking at the number yep. of defects these are counts yep so they're pretty basic you yep. know it's not like you got to get really fancy with this stuff and i try not to get you know when i'm just teaching somebody how to i'm not going to talk about like oh well you need to figure yeah. out whether you need a p or a u or a c or a <laughs> wait a minute I, 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 feel, I feel like I your distribution is plenty <laughs> what you know we need to look at a, <laughs> it's like what <laughs> you know i'm just trying to get you to put that give me some weekly data here man yeah, or exactly. if it's platy kurtik man who cares <laughs> you know so yeah no good stuff right yeah, that's one of the things I don't teach. I don't teach yeah. people that are on the front yeah. line how to do well, it. Well, you know, and there's a t there's a <laughs> and there's a place for it, right? It can you be know, a little some bit people will do it, right? Yeah. And but yeah, do the, does that front line worker need to be worrying about their their CP and CPK? Probably not. Not not on a daily basis. And that's yeah, depending on what they're doing, but but probably not. You know, so yeah. But I tell you, when you, it, it's funny because people will say, "Oh, I'm working on a Six Sigma project. What's your Sigma level?" Yeah. Well, I don't have one. Right. then you're not working right. on a Six Sigma project. <laughs> At most, you're working on a design for Six right. Sigma because right. your exactly. Sigma level right now is exactly. zero. I don't have any data. <laughs> okay, definitely not a Six Sigma project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And that's where it's, it's always funny because, you know, like they don't realize that. And we even teach like getting to Sigma level at analysis and really if you need to know what your sigma level is up right. front that should be part of your define if you don't know that then your right. first job is right. to figure out what's going on how can i measure defects versus the volume and you know just right. get to a basic dpmo right. no exactly exactly and that's why we're not purist on 
Six Sigma, Lean, or whatever. It's like, just let's figure out what problem are you trying to solve? How do you know it's a problem? And let's go on and do it. And you might not need a single so-called Six Sigma tool, or you might be mostly the traditional lean approach. Right. However, let's throw in a measurement system analysis because you're using those calipers over to measure those parts on the daily, you know, like, are you any good at it? <laughs> you know, you know, and so that's yep. where I'm, I feel like it, this, these, all these camps, you know, the lean guys, six Sigma guys, you know, it's like, Oh my word. You know, it's like, you know, just stop it. You know, like just make sure that you're, you're learn it all. And that way you can use <laughs> what you need to use when you need to use it. You know, and yeah, use as few a tools as possible to solve your problem. That's a beautiful project, right? <laughs> so. And and if you get the problem to be really small, you can get them done. You can solve things quickly. Yeah, especially when you get that daily data, right? <laughs> exactly, and that's. Yeah. I think that that's like the biggest thing to walk away from training is to understand yeah. how to make big problems yep. little tiny problems and solve them quickly. And that's, re I mean, kind of how our, our program is a little bit different is because we're not like, oh, well, you've got to save, right. um, you know, 150000 or 500000 on this type of project. No, we want to see you apply this methodology and learn how to break right. down problems to understand them and solve them. Right. If you can do that, right. you can yeah. do that with it's, anything. It, I feel like. And I, and I did. I know when I was going through way back when my black belt projects and all the rest of it, you feel this pressure like that. This is my one chance, you know, to, you know, make a mark here. I got one black belt project, you know, and this is it, you know, but no, you, it's not it. It's the first one of hopefully hundreds and hundreds of projects that you're going to run over yep. your career, man. You know, so don't put so much pressure on yourself. So, yeah. In the military, we used to have a term called Jeep. <laughs> it means just educated enough to pass. Yeah. And wherever you were, whatever you were doing, yeah. you were always, you, you'd come in as a Jeep. You'd be like the first Jeep staff sergeant or the first Jeep on the, you know, in the assignment. Yeah. But you didn't know anything and you had to learn. And I, I always look at that. I'm sure you've probably seen people who have certification programs that are run by individuals with a lot of experience who just mm -hmm. want to prove oh boy. how smart they well, are right. and how little yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. And it's just, that's so destructive. You know, like, come on, it, these people are going through this for the very first time. Yep. I cannot expect them to be experts at this. They're learning and they will continue to learn and it'll take years to be able to, I still look a lot of things up because yep. I don't remember yep. like how to do that. Exactly. Like, oh, yeah, I, I know you've heard me Google, say this before, but, but I've Googled out a book. stuff and found our old our blog articles that I wrote 10 years ago <laughs> with the answer. I was like, Oh man, <laughs> how crazy is that? You know, <laughs> but you're right. I mean, I remember going through some training again, way back when and I had some super smart folks that were teaching me. One gentleman was his big PhD statistics, blah, 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 you know, and he got up there and he's just to your point, just, showing off man i don't know and, and i remember sitting there like lost but like sort of like humiliated but i wasn't about to raise my hand you know and so i remember thinking man when i'm teaching people like i, I figured it out on my own after <laughs> class you know I, I did figure it out the topic but it wasn't because of that person but i remember thinking i'm never gonna make someone feel like that i'm gonna do my best to never make someone feel like that you know and, and anyhow i feel like I mean, we're kind of biased, I guess, on Academy, but I, I feel like we really do that. You know, we try to help people where they are and, um, yeah, and not make it so overwhelming. I, I've seen a program once where there was a director and she went into the board. Okay, you know, they have the board and there's like five people on that board who've been around process improvement forever. And then they look at all of the tools that you're required to use and then they just pick them apart. And she came out of this thing. She's a director. Mm. And she came out crying. And we were in the midst of kind of like re-engineering the entire program. And that became a mantra for us is a respect mm -hmm. for the employee. You've heard that before, right? Respect for the right. employee. We're not going to treat people like that. Yep. Exactly. That's not, it's exactly. not right. Well, good stuff, man. Well, <laughs> hey, man, it's been fun, John, as always. I'm sure we'll do it again down the road, but uh, keep up the good work. I know the great work. I know you, you've got more candidates than me and Steve, I think, combined now. So uh, appreciate all you've done for, for Gev Academy since you've come on because you sure have helped uh, 
helped our sanity levels. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it's yeah. exciting, and I think yeah. a lot of people get a lot out of it. So that's what yeah. I you know I think that's the most important thing is getting people the ahas at the end of the project. I love asking the questions on what were yeah. the top things that you got yeah. out of this? What did you learn that was most important? Yeah. It's always different. Exactly. But, you know, and that's what they're going to carry uh -huh. forward. They're going to remember the ahas, right? So, yeah, very good. Hey, if folks want to connect with you, I know you, you're you busy on LinkedIn, man. You, you, you got some prolific LinkedIn posts daily, right? Every day, seven days a week. Yeah. <laughs> Daily. Every day. Every day on business and success. I just, you know, want to share everything from, yeah. you know, personal or professional success, businesses, how to improve. It's interesting because I see people that say mm. constantly tell people what to do. So like, yes, or just today I saw somebody is like mm. telling people you need to document your processes. Well, no kidding. Right. But how right. and why and what am I going to do with it? And that's the, the thing that I try to always share every day is yeah. a little bit of how or why or what do you do with it? Because that's the biggest thing. It's like we can tell people what to do all day long. So if they, you know, it's John Knotts on LinkedIn. The, the one that you, every I day. Was, maybe yesterday <laughs> I love engagement. Or the day before, I can't remember, I saw it. It was one of my favorites. You talked about being the rock. What was that? Give, give us a quick synopsis on that one. We'll link to it. I'll have Jessica link it up. But <laughs> This actually came because I was the superintendent of a commander's action group in Air Intelligence Agency. So it's all Air Force Intel, working directly for a two-star commander. And we were responsible for the auditorium. So they have big PowerPoint presentations up there and all this kind of stuff. And occasionally something would happen, much yep. like the computer yep. issue that you yep. had coming into this podcast. So, you know, like they'll run into something like the light will burn out or it won't turn on or whatever. And, of course, we had a phone call and somebody was had immediate response to come in because it's the commander's auditorium. But these people would come in freaking out. And I'd always say to the nine people that worked in there, I said, there is no such thing as a PowerPoint emergency. We need to be calm, cool, and collected, and we need to just pick up the phone and make our phone mm -hmm. call. We cannot assume their craziness. <laughs> and that's, I think, you know, like being consistent. This is for, like, leaders, for employees, for just people. Being consistent and constant in what you do. If you make a decision you're going to do something, just do it. And just keep plugging away at it. Sometimes you'll feel like you're not really going anywhere, but you are. And I, I can, you know, like occasionally you'll feel like, is this posting every day really making a difference? And then I'll get some, because I send out, when they allow us to do the birthday things, I send out happy birthday every day to people that are have birthdays. And occasionally I'll get somebody to reply and say, I really yeah. appreciate your posts. And they've never, I've never talked to yeah. them before. And I'm like, okay, somebody's reading that I don't even know they're reading. So that's important. But that's what kind of like being the rock is the rock in the middle of a stream is unmovable. It may get softened over time. Mm -hmm. It may change a little bit, but it's not going to move. Yeah. Well, if, and that's if anything, where it gets a little smoother, we need to be, you know, like for family, a little bit friends. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Looks yeah, better. Exactly. <laughs> so it. we get better with age, right? <laughs> but yeah, that's what the post was all about. I try to do things like that on the weekends yeah. because it's yeah. more personal and yeah than professional. But yeah. yeah, I always try to always try to share and I, I like engagement. I like people to get in there. Tell me I'm wrong. Because I, I probably am, and I'd like your input. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, like sometimes I'll just post stuff that I really like. I'm going to push some buttons because okay. I want people to right. argue it. Right, right. Because you 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 learn more when you get more sides of the story, more sides of the idea, yep. than just your own. Yeah, I had a boss one time back in my corporate days. He said, you know, there's like I don't know, ten of us in a, in a room. We were all managers reporting to this person, and and they said. The boss said, hey, if all 10 of you are agreeing, I got nine too many. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, yep. like, yeah. So, exactly. Sometimes right. you want disagreement. Yeah. Yeah. 
All right. Well, good. Thanks again, John. It's been fun. And uh, I know you got a busy, (laughs) probably got some coaching calls to do here shortly. So (laughs) I do. I have one coming up. All right. Take care. Thanks, John. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening. Whether you've been on the continuous improvement journey for many years, or perhaps you're just getting started, Gemba Academy is here to support you. And while we're best known for our more than 1,500 Lean and Six Sigma teaching and virtual tour videos, we also have a team of experienced Lean and Six Sigma practitioners available for one-on-one coaching, as well as a variety of Lean and Six Sigma certification options. To learn more and to schedule a demo, head on over to GembaAcademy.com.